Chapter 2. The Stupidity of Intelligence As soon as intelligence takes itself as its object, it is destined to transform into stupidity, either as the G-factor or as intellect. If the psychologist's intelligence is stupid, then, in the end, that of the philosophers may be equally so. The philosophical self-assertion of the mind, claiming the sovereignty of the mind or intellect, always seems to result in a ridiculous form of celebration of the self that is no better than the reductionism of psychologists. Catherine Malibu, in 2019. Two point one AI Failure Trauma Dupery The dictionary definition of intelligence from the Latin intus between and leger to choose entails variously the ability to discern, make decisions, comprehend, to have skill, art, taste, and ultimately knowledge. But the term artificial preceding intelligence gives one the immediate impression that we have a sound definition of what real intelligence is, a conceit that in philosophical terms elides techne and episteme, and in psychoanalytic terms takes for granted the distinct categories of knowledge, truth, and most significantly, enjoyment. Human intelligence entails various interactions between different skills, for example, a combination and interaction of visual perception, motor skills, memory, speech, spatial reasoning, auditory processing, may be utilized at any given moment. These skills are, of course, not all transparently understandable to the intelligent human utilizing them. This is the paradox at the heart of debates between neuroscience and philosophical accounts of consciousness, which start from fundamentally different premises on how we may talk about subjective phenomena. For example, at its crudest level, just because you can see, it does not mean that you know how vision works, and conversely, knowing how vision works does not guarantee that you will be able to see. This same sort of combination of functions will be present in any complex AI program, which will have integrated elements the core processor knows how to access. This may include evidence-based reasoning, language skills, text analysis, sensors, decision-making, data analysis, and so on. For example, can a program that processes visual information be said to understand how vision works? Or does facial recognition software operate in the same intuitive way for computers as it does for humans? According to some computer scientists, the answer is yes. Computers, like humans, have intuition. So in very basic terms, we can see that there is a discrepancy between technical or machinic capacity and theoretical knowledge, which is integral to the concept of artificial intelligence as it is commonly used. However, as Lydia Liu notes, it is one thing to argue that the human brain can be augmented by the computer chip, and another to imagine that the logic of the computer and the human psyche are analogous. This prosthetic argument, as she calls it, is an alibi for something more fundamental that has been going on since the mid-20th century. And this is the cybernetic conception of the human psyche as a computing machine. What remains to date the pervasive paradigm for thinking about artificial intelligence is the relationship between the computer and the brain. But as we shall see, this specific focus on the analogy of the brain and the computer leaves important psychoanalytic questions unbroached. In recent times, the field of artificial intelligence has grown exponentially with a multitude of technical approaches provoking interest from various philosophical perspectives surrounding its conceptual ramifications. Today, AI encapsulates a huge range of phenomena, including those that fall under goal-oriented, narrow AI, or artificial narrow intelligence, ANI, which perform limited tasks such as sorting, tracking, predicting, or recognizing the data patterns based on a range of different algorithms. These may be used in applications like Google Search and Amazon's Alexa, or more sophisticated AI in the development of autonomous vehicles, or AVs, Apple's Project Titan and Tesla's Autopilot, preventative medicine, Microsoft AI, and, more controversially, autonomous weapon systems. At the end of the spectrum, however, one finds robotics, deep learning, and neural networks, 
which find a more complex outlet in simulations and perhaps most intriguingly, the Blue Brain Project, as we shall discuss. A recent volume of essays, Alleys of Your Mind, Augmented Intelligence and Its Traumas, tackles the question of artificial intelligence from the perspective of contemporary critical theory. The collection gathers contributions from leading thinkers who all in diverse ways criticize popular conceptions of AI and ask the questions, what thinking means in the age of artificial intelligence and how does big scale computation transform the ways in which our brains function. The book's main conceit is to uncover the positive role played by error and trauma in the construction of our contemporary technological minds. In his contribution to the volume, Matteo Pasqualini argues that current philosophical debates on the question of technology and reason fall between, on the one hand, neo-materialism, and on the other, neo-rationalism, or, in other words, positions that draw on either Whitehead or Sellers, the former being a proponent of the agency of technical objects, matter, and effects, and the latter addressing rather the primacy of reason and its potential forms of autonomization, or the ability for synthetic reason to become autonomous. Pascolini sees this as the wrong distinction to be making, however, and believes instead that no paradigm of cognition and computation can be assessed without the recognition of the epistemic abnormal, or what he calls noetic failure, which we could translate as mental or intellectual error. This would mean a distinction should be made between philosophies that acknowledge a positive role for error, abnormality, pathology, trauma, and catastrophe, and those who support a flat ontology without these dynamic, self-organizing, and constitutive ruptures on the other. Following the Frankfurt School's lessons on the trauma of reason, Pasqualini asserts that the reason of trauma must be rediscovered as the actual inner logic of the age of intelligent machines. In his introduction to the volume, he asserts that one day, it will not be arbitrary to reframe 20th century thought and its intelligent machines as a quest for the positive definition of error, abnormality, trauma, and catastrophe, a set of concepts that need to be understood in their cognitive, technological, and political composition. Drawing parallels with Foucault's history of biopower and technologies of the self as sharing common roots with cybernetics and its error-friendly machines, and arguing that Deleuze and Guattari's desiring machines were in fact echoing research on war trauma and brain plasticity from the First World War, he states that, Across the history of computation, from early cybernetics to artificial intelligence and current algorithmic capitalism, both mainstream technology and critical responses to it have shared a common belief in the determinism and positivism of the instrumental or technological rationality to use the formulation of the Frankfurt School. The aim of the collection, therefore, is to highlight conversely the role of error, trauma, and catastrophe in the design of intelligent machines and the theory of augmented cognition. Pasqualini argues that the definition of intelligence remains an open problem since, from a philosophical point of view, human intelligence is always artificial in the first place, engendering, as it does, novel dimensions of cognition. Intelligence is a combination of various complex and multifaceted capacities which defy easy definition. Pasqualini discerns three major fallacies in the current debates on the state of artificial intelligence. Firstly, the anthropocentric fallacy which naively assumes artificial intelligence would be analogous to human intelligence in the superficial sense of attributing menacing and threatening motives to AI. In this vision of AI, it is a malevolent predator whose aim is to expunge us, or at the very least, make us suffer. Secondly, the bootstrapping fallacy, which imagines a seamless exponential growth of machine intelligence similar to the progress of human psychological development in the sense that the relative and progressive complexity of cognitive tasks for humans is directly mapped onto the progress of machinic intelligence. This fallacy errs when it fails to reckon with the different forms of cognitive capability that human intelligence entails, 
and the ways in which some processes that are very difficult for humans are easily replicable by algorithms, while other seemingly simple human tasks are hugely complex engineering feats for AI. And finally, the third problem is the singularity fallacy, which, combining elements of the previous two problems, entails the belief that there will be a decisive point of unification and synchronization of different technologies simulating, augmenting, and ultimately surpassing human intelligence, which, taken together, form a homogeneous and all-powerful mode of thought, capable of rendering human intelligence, and by extension, the species in general, redundant. Pasqualini's criticisms of the current fallacies surrounding conceptions of AI and the need to approach AI from the basis of error, trauma, and catastrophe points to the implicitly psychoanalytic dimensions and implications of AI. Firstly, the issue Pasqualini points to with imaginary identification, which seems to be pervasive in our misapprehensions of artificial intelligence. This entails the assumption that the ability to communicate symbolically entails an element of intersubjectivity, which is fundamentally misguided. In Lacanian terms, this relates to the question of misrecognition or imaginary méconnaissance and, ultimately, transference. Secondly, we should consider more closely the characterization of the concept of trauma and pathology as the unacknowledged ontologically significant factor in the positivist project of AI research. This is the concern that the whole of the Freudian enterprise was built on, the concept of trauma and the reformulation of what was previously conceived as pathology as inherent to psychic structure. This was not least because it was via trauma and the symptom that Freud found the way into deciphering his very first patient's hysterical symptoms, and neither merely in the sense of the discovery of an unfortunate and disturbing event, but rather that trauma, as Freud described it, and Lacan formalized it, was structurally constitutive of the psychoanalytic subject. The subject, in psychoanalytic terms, is characterized by a constitutive failure. Benjamin Bratton likewise warns that contemporary polemics around the meaning of thinking and living with radically other forms of synthetic intelligence crucially misunderstand the real issues at stake, stuck as they are in anthropocentric appreciations of AI. As far as Bratton is concerned, we should resist the temptation to understand AI through the lens of human intelligence, for to do so would be self-defeating, unethical, and perhaps even dangerous. For this reason, he advocates a broadening up of the concept of intelligence to situate human intelligence as just one form of intelligence along a larger continuum. In this way, he promotes a form of anti-bigotry in our understanding of what may count as intelligent thought, a step towards a better appreciation of the challenges involved in living and thinking with the other of artificial intelligence. Bratton suggests that our fantasies of AI as either desperately wishing to be human, for example, Steven Spielberg's AI, or Chris Columbus's Bicentennial Man, or malevolently fixated on our destruction, for example, James Cameron's The Terminator, or more recently, various episodes of Charlie Brooker's series Black Mirror, merely reflect our own desires, paranoia, and narcissistic self-image. That AI would be so invested in getting our attention is perhaps pure wishful thinking. The worst-case scenario may well be that they wouldn't even notice us at all. The real nightmare, even worse, that the one in which the big machine wants to kill you, is the one in which it sees you as irrelevant or not even as a discreet thing to know. Worse than being seen as an enemy is not being seen at all. The idea of artificial intelligence being perceived as like humans, Bratton says, is a valid point of departure, but not a valid conclusion to end up with. Furthermore, an important distinction Bratton makes in AI research is between the terms artificial stupidity and artificial idiocy where the first term refers to faults deliberately programmed into AI in order to make it more realistically human, i.e. not winning every time in a game in which it could easily beat a human every time. The second term refers to the problem that occurs when an AI performs its tasks too well, to the detriment of other factors. The apocalyptic example used originally by Nick Bostrom is the paperclip generator that follows its orders to continue making paperclips until the world is overrun by an avalanche of paperclips. 
This is the idiocy of AI so-called. In his first example, AI stupidity has the function of creating a social bond between itself and its human companion. AI idiocy, on the other hand, has the aim of following its master's instructions so ideologically that it allows all other factors to pale into insignificance. So here, the blind spot functions in different places, or one could say the enjoyment produced is different in each case. The stupidity or idiocy of AI, as Bratton calls it, may therefore be seen as a discursive structure in which enjoyment is produced according to the relative positions of truth and knowledge. The concept of stupidity, therefore, is one which has fundamental structural importance in relation to the question of enjoyment. Bratton also draws attention to what he sees as the inherently bigoted approach humans have to AI, since, as he puts it, the Turing test's aim was to fool an interlocutor that an AI was human, so the AI had to be in drag. But as Bratton remarks, the thing about actual drag is you are not supposed to convince someone you are a member of the opposite sex, but merely get them to suspend their belief about your sexual or gender identity in the disavowed form of I know very well but. This he discusses with relation to the scandal surrounding Turing's outing as a homosexual man, illegal at the time, and his subsequent chemical castration causing Turing an unspeakable suffering, which in the end led him to commit suicide. Given that Turing's imitation game was based on the logic of tricking an interlocutor into believing that you were a particular gender, at which the AI had to perform as well as the human, the parallels are significant. One notes the sour ironic correspondence between asking an AI to pass the test in order to qualify as intelligent to pass as human intelligence, with Turing's own need to hide his sexuality and to pass as a straight man. The demands of both bluffs are unnecessary and profoundly unfair. However, the question of the relationship between sexual identity and AI is in fact far more psychoanalytically complex than a political irony about the potential problems with anthropocentrism in AI research, as Bratton suggests. As we shall discuss further in Chapter 5, the Turing Test, when closely examined, demonstrates the fundamental basis for the relationship between sexuation in psychoanalytic terms and artificial intelligence. In essence, Bratton's arguably utopian message is that instead of forcing AI into prefigured stereotypes about the type of thinking that we may recognize as real, we should allow AI in all its diverse forms, about which we are continually learning, to teach humans a more fuller and truer range of what thinking can be. Diversifying what counts as thought is in keeping with the realist turn in contemporary theory and offers us an important perspective in relation to pushing psychoanalytic paradigms beyond post-structuralist tendencies. But furthermore, we should pay attention to the fact that, as Bratton himself points out in his example of AI stupidity, there is a constitutive part of thought that involves a dialectical relationship between the positions of truth and knowledge in any given discursive framework. 2.2 Omega Numbers and Suture Let us press further the question of thinking in philosophical approaches to AI. In her essay, Instrumental Reason, Algorithmic Capitalism, and the Incomputable, Luciana Parisi asks, can the critique of instrumental rationality, as addressed by critical theory, still be based on the distinction between critical thinking and automation? Can one truly argue that algorithmic automation is always already a static reduction of critical thinking? She argues that with the all-machine phase transition of digital capitalism, we are bearing witness to a new mode of thought and control. This phase, identified by a group of physicists from the University of Miami, coincides with the introduction of high-frequency stock trading after 2006 and entails sub-millisecond speed algorithm-to-algorithm -algorithm interactions that exceed human response time. Having analyzed the millisecond-scale data at the core of financial markets, they discovered a series of sub-second extreme events caused by these algorithms Given this state of affairs, Parisi argues that 
Due to the inhuman scale on which these events unfold, this changes significantly our capacity to analyze them using the tools of traditional critical theory. Crucially, she asserts that the traditional critical theory reproach that accuses computation of reducing human thought to mechanical operations is no longer sufficient as an analytical paradigm for our current state of affairs. Since these events are outside the limits of human control and comprehension, she cites computer scientist and mathematician Gregory Chaitlin's conviction that incomputability and randomness are in fact the very condition of computation. This means that the incomputable forms part of instrumental rationality itself. Parisi identifies the dilemma thus. Both philosophical thought and digitality rely on principles of indetermination and uncertainty while featuring these principles in their core complexity theories. As such, both challenge and define the neoliberal order at the same time. A paradox. Addressing this paradox, she argues for a turn to Chaitlin's concept of incomputability, and specifically his discovery of the incomputable omega number, a number which is definable but not computable. As Parisi explains, Omega defines at once a discrete and infinite state of computation occupying the space between zero and one. She sees this as bringing not only the philosophical critique of technical rationalization into question, but also the instrumentalization of reason. This signals, she says, an irreversible transformation in the history of critical thought, in which the incomputable function of reason has entered into the automated infrastructure of cognition. However, this recognition from a Lacanian point of view is actually not so new at all. Parisi's identification of the mysterious omega number, which unsettles all attempts to ground rationality on computation, being both a discrete yet infinite space between zero and one, and therefore incomputable, uncannily brings to mind the fundamental psychoanalytic notion of suture. In Jacques-Alain Miller's Suture paper, the first great Lacanian text not to be written by Lacan himself, Miller presents a logic of the signifier, now widely accepted as the strict formalization of the Lacanian logic of the signifier, although never systematized by Lacan himself. The paper grounds the logic with recourse to Frege's attempts at a logical conception of the sequence of whole natural numbers in which the categories of concept, object, and number are distinguished in order to establish the zero as the only object subsumable under the concept of non-identity to itself. As the editors of Concept and Form note, two relations are furthermore assumed by Miller, the subsumption of the object under the concept and the assignation of a number to the concept. By virtue of the thing non-identical with itself being evoked only to then be excluded from the dimension of truth, Miller shows how Frege grounds the concept of number on a performative contradiction. This concept, by virtue of being a concept, has an extension, subsumes an object. Which object? None. Since truth is, no object falls into the place of the subsumed of this concept, and the number which qualifies its extension is zero. In this engendering of the zero, I have stressed that it is supported by the proposition that truth is. If no object falls under the concept of non-identical with itself, it is because truth must be saved. If there are no things which are not identical with themselves, it is because non-identity with itself is contradictory to the very dimension of truth. To its concept, we assign the zero. Via this reading of Frege, Miller elaborates the paradoxical logic of the signifier and the subject of lack present in all discourses that aim at truth. Without entering into a comparative set theoretical or conceptual discussion of Parisi's position versus Frege, it suffices to highlight that significant critical approaches to the question of AI seem to coincide with a logical paradox about the position of truth within discourse. In Parisi's case, the supposed discrepancy that lies between the opposed discourses of rationality and computation are undermined by the apparition of a mysterious stain on reality that does not seem to fit into either side of the binary opposition of subjectivity and objectivity, as she characterizes it. 
in reference to the Turing machine qua absolute mechanism of iteration based on step-by-step procedures, Parisi argues that Nothing is more opposed to pure thought, or the being of the sensible, as Deleuze called it, than this discrete, based machine of universal calculation, the Turing architecture of prearranged units that could be interchangeably exchanged along a sequence is effectively the opposite of an ontogenetic thought, moving through a differential continuum, through intensive encounters and affect. What does Parisi here mean by the delusion reference to ontogenetic thought, intensive encounters, and its affect? How does this translate into psychoanalytic terms? This concern with the mysterious omega number we may also read with reference to Lacan's early engagements with cybernetics in Seminar 2 and his écrit Logical Time and the Assertion of Anticipated Certainty, in which he draws attention to the significance of the algorithmic calculation of possibilities central to cybernetic theory and its possible use for constructing a psychoanalytic theory of causation. In his essay on logical time, Lacan illustrates via the thought experiment of the prisoner's dilemma how rational calculation also contained within it a temporal dimension that was entirely subjective, and conversely, how free action is only ever constituted via a universal rule. What makes this act so remarkable in the subjective assertion demonstrated by this sophism is that it anticipates its own certainty owing to the temporal tension with which it is subjectively charged, and that, based on this very anticipation, its certainty is verified in a logical precipitation that is determined by the discharge of this tension so that in the end the conclusion is no longer grounded on anything but completely objectified temporal instances, and the assertion is desubjectified to the utmost. When deciding how to act in order to secure their freedom, the prisoners were entirely dependent on their intersubjective positioning towards one another. This involved not the flat ontology of hyper-rationality, but, as Wright observed, the temporality of living scansion, the remarkable thing here is that any act of freedom retroactively constitutes a completely determined mode of causality, but is nonetheless experienced as subjectively authored. In Seminar 2, Lacan uses Edgar Allan Poe's purloined letter to illustrate the fundamentally illusory effect of chance that resides in the game of odds and evens, highlighting how we tend to see coincidence in certain numerical patterns where, mathematically speaking, there is only probability chance being purely an effect of structure. This becomes significant clinically when, in Seminar 11, Lacan makes an important distinction between two different kinds of psychoanalytic causality, broadly corresponding to necessity and contingency. The first, Lacan calls automaton and refers to a type of programmed repetition of behavior, and the second, touché, corresponds to the chance and unpredictable encounter with the real. In terms of the speech of the analysand, this is experienced as an unprecedented event, a radical subjective freedom that erupts from the chain of pure machinic determination by the symbolic order. It is this unpredictable encounter with the real that we may call stupid, in that it by necessity lacks any rational explanation. It seems that Parisi envisions rationality as precisely this continuum of imminent affect, totally transparent to itself, and self-positing, in other words, being and thinking here are the same thing. Parisi diagnoses the problem as one of discrete units versus continuous movement, perhaps a problem one could put differently in Lacanian terms as touché versus automaton, or mathematization versus topology. Whilst Parisi attempts to obviate the question of the subject in relation to AI, it nevertheless slips in via the back door. For what is the function of the omega number if not to guarantee absolute contingency in necessity and absolute freedom within determinism? It seems the omega number, like the Lacanian real, always returns to its place and never stops being written. 2.3. Malibu and the Blue Brain In 2005, the Blue Brain Project was set up by Professor Henry Markram at the EFPL the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Lausanne, Switzerland. The aim of the project is to build biologically detailed digital reconstructions, 
and simulations of the rodent brain and ultimately the human brain. The project's supercomputer-based reconstructions promise to offer a radically new approach to understanding and simulating the multi-level structure and functioning of the brain. Whilst the progress of the project continues apace due to the immense complexity of the human brain, the BBP still only manages to simulate tiny portions of the brain in order to extrapolate larger findings from their limited but ever-growing harvest of data. The aim, according to their mission statement, however, is to be able to simulate in ever more detail the complex multi-level activity across different parts of the brain that would be impossible to investigate in living tissue. Researchers at the BBP may manipulate tissue in various ways, for example by knocking out or lesioning parts of the circuit. As it stands, the researchers are capable of digitally reconstructing brain tissue in silico to simulate a snapshot of the anatomy and physiology of the brain at any one moment in time. They can use these digital reconstructions for a virtually unlimited range of simulations in order to replicate the spontaneous electrical activity of a real brain. The project is currently building neurorobotic tools, which will enable the researchers to replicate cognitive behavioral experiments in animals, with the aim of extrapolating this data to generate further understanding and simulations of the human brain. Ultimately, BBP is attempting what has hitherto been the preserve of science fiction and fantasy, building a fully functional non-biological brain. Even though the technology needed is still in its early stages, in theory, with enough computer power, the Blue Brain Project envisages the possibility of complete digital simulation of the human brain. It is illuminating, therefore, to consider the raison d'etre of their project. Understanding the brain is vital, not just to understand the biological mechanisms which give us our thoughts and emotions and which make us human, but for practical reasons. Understanding how the brain processes information can make a fundamental contribution to the development of new computing technology. Whilst the BBP recognizes the value of understanding the brain, since as they put it, it gives us thoughts, emotions, and ultimately, humanity, it appears as an almost secondary benefit. The most important driver in the development of the Blue Brain Project is less about understanding the human mind and more about the development of new, more powerful computing technology. So we have a curious reflexivity at play. By modeling the technology on the structure of the brain, we may come to better understand the functioning of the brain, which in turn helps us to develop new and better computing technology in order to then model the brain in more detail. It is a perfectly circular argument which depicts the persistent computational metaphor at play in popular understandings of the human brain ever since the beginning of cybernetics. Furthermore, the Blue Brain Project, with its absolute faith in the power of digital simulation, promises the erasure of the boundary between the functioning of the virtual and the actual, and opens up the conceptual question of the possibility of a completely simulated intelligence. But if the brain is nothing more than a highly complex system which we are gaining the ability to reproduce digitally, at what point would the simulation cross over from virtual to real? Or, in Hegelian terms, when would it pass from substance to subject? The Blue Brain Project and other significant developments in the field of brain science, for example Neuralink, pose profound questions across many fields of research, not just in artificial intelligence and engineering, but in philosophy, ethics, and even cosmology. In the wake of these groundbreaking developments challenging our notions of biological intelligence, the response from some significant thinkers has been suitably radical. One of them comes from Catherine Malibu. In her book, Morphing Intelligence, From IQ Measurements to Artificial Brains, Malibu mounts not just a critique of but a rejection of her previous position on the status of the concept of intelligence as laid out in her seminal work, What Should We Do With Our Brain?, where she explores the neuroscientific notion of brain plasticity. In her latest book, Malibu continues what she describes as her examination of the space between biological and symbolic life. Malibu argues that in light of the development of synaptic chips and the Blue Brain Project, her former thesis on brain plasticity was chauvinistically humanist. The arrival on the scene of the artificial brain signals, in Malibu's view, 
a watershed moment that changes the status of human intelligence to quote. She goes as far as to state that her previous stance on plasticity was wrong, privileging as it did a biologically based model of intelligence. Her new perspective reconceives the brain as something not purely biological with the capacity for plasticity, but rather an entity whose symbolic character does not necessarily require a biological substrate at all. Malibu lays out a genealogy of the scientific formulation of the concept of intelligence starting in the 19th century and tracks its appropriation by historians, psychologists, biologists, and philosophers, and the disputes that arose from their discussion over its meaning. Malibu goes on to outline what she calls the three main metamorphoses of intelligence, which she calls, firstly, genetic fate, secondly, epigenesis and synaptic simulation, and lastly, the power of automatism. The first metamorphosis is that pertaining to the invention of the IQ test and the conceptualization of intelligence as a measurable entity for the first time in the 19th century. This led to the beginning of eugenics from the work of proto-geneticist Francis Galton, followed by Alfred Binet, and Theodore Simon's research in the field of molecular biology and the sequencing of the human genome. The second metamorphosis is supposedly our current configuration, that which is encompassed by the field of epigenetics. In other words, our generally and widely accepted understanding of the intelligence that takes into account the effects of environmental factors, education, culture, on the plastic functioning of the brain as the locus of intelligence. This second metamorphosis is largely locatable to the moment of the 20th century, when the relation between history and biology, thanks in part to French epistemologists such as Bachelard, Canguilhem, and the latter's students, Foucault and Simondon, started to be appreciated in a new light. It is the start of this reappraisal of the innatist and performationist character of intelligence that, Malibu argues, opens the door towards the possibility of the cybernetic brain that came to dominate the late 20th century, giving weight to the computer brain metaphor. The third metamorphosis is still to come. This would entail the removal of the boundary between nature and artifice, a conceptualization of intelligence that allowed for the simulation of brain activity to constitute something more complex and significant than a biopolitical threat to humanity. Rather, it would signal a next stage in the evolution of the concept of intelligent life itself. On this score, we would have to approach artificial intelligence in a completely different way, and ask, what do we really mean when we call intelligence artificial? This is in part what Malibu's book attempts to address, the unsaid and undisclosed dimensions of the concept of intelligence that lead us into prejudice as to what counts as intelligent life. She asks, How then should we situate artificial life in relation to biological and symbolic life? Is it an intruder, ever foreign and heterogeneous to them both, existing only as a threatening replica? Or is it, rather, the necessary intermediary that enables their dialectical interrelation? Indeed, how should we situate artificial life? Malibu does not attempt to resolve this question in the book and the question of life in relation to intelligence remains indeterminate. In the postscript to Morphing Intelligence, Malibu admits that while writing the book she had not yet realized the extent to which the issue of intelligence, particularly artificial intelligence, had become a pressing issue when bound up with significant social, political, legal, and economic implications. It was the enthusiastic reception of her book that made her aware that society once again expresses a deep and urgent need for philosophy, a need for new tools to help it address the urgent questions posed by AI as a transformational technology that, by virtue of its challenge to the traditional structures of information systems, brings about a total upheaval of being in the world. The nature of these challenges, Malibu argues, require a philosophical approach that would allow us to apprehend rationally and without delusion a radical revolution not only in the conditions of thought, knowledge, and expertise, notions commonly associated with intelligence, but in every field of activity, affectivity, and the human psyche. 
This point is underscored by Malibu's parting shot, a quote from Freud's introductory lectures on psychoanalysis, on the third blow to human narcissism that was psychoanalysis. Reflecting on the transformational nature of AI, Malibu asserts that the fourth blow, as she sees it, will be the capturing of intelligence by its own simulation, exceeding and transcending it. After reflecting on the upheaval that is AI, Malibu posits that the challenge is to invent a community with machines together, even when we share nothing in common with them. Never will there be a community of machines. The automatic creation they are capable of will have a political platform and ethical texture only if we endow them with it. It is this final summation of her position that seems paradoxically at odds with the spirit of Malibu's book. For why, given AI's status here as the fourth blow to humanity, would machines not be capable of politics, an ethical act, or the founding of a community? It seems that whilst Malibu rightly refrains from reifying intelligence, she falls into precisely the trap she is warning others of, viewing artificial intelligence as some perfectly spherical and discrete other, unknowable and absolute. It is interesting, then, that it is the concept of stupidity which Malibu notes becomes absolutely pivotal in the tradition of French thinking on intelligence. Significantly, as she points out, the genealogy of modern French thought on the question of intelligence from Proust to Flaubert to Villery has always been accompanied by a reflection on stupidity to which Deleuze's difference and repetition and Derrida's The Beast and the Sovereign would subsequently devote much thought, making stupidity the object of a properly transcendental question. As she puts it, a single word, intelligence, characterizes both genius, natural intelligence, and machines, artificial intelligence. A gift is like a motor. It works by itself and does not come of itself. In this sense, then, it is stupid. Malibu concludes that intelligence and stupidity are but one qualifying their respective fruitless striving for an essence as nothing more than ontological stubbornness. If such is the case, then why not give up intelligence as an independent philosophical question? The defenses are finally gathering to form this position. Ultimately, the ontological void of intelligence is never as evident as in the stupidity of ontology, a stupidity that is, perhaps, not so very distinct from the stupidity of psychology. Despite her emphasis here on the question of stupidity, Malibu maintains her commitment to rationality, as key to a better understanding of the possibilities of artificial forms of intelligence. It is curious, then, that Malibu, given her long-standing dialogue with Freudian and Lacanian psychoanalysis, raises the question of stupidity given its relationship to enjoyment, for stupidity appears at various times in Lacan's seminar. In fact, he says plainly that the signifier is stupid, and more poetically, if an angel has such a stupid smile, that is because it is up to its ears in the supreme signifier. To find itself on dry land would do it some good. Perhaps it wouldn't smile anymore. Stupidity, whilst not systematized by Lacan in theoretical terms, is nevertheless emblematic of much of his conceptual endeavors. His three passions, love, hate, and ignorance, could all be called stupid. The latter passion, ignorance, is perhaps the most self-evidently stupid, of which Lacan speaks in Seminar 19 in relation to the savoir of the analyst, ignorance being the basis of the analytic relationship, a level of knowledge attributed to the analyst which in fact resides in a blind spot in the analysand themselves. Then, in Seminar 20, ignorance becomes a divine attribute. Lacan reminds us that Freud arms himself with Empodocles' statement that God must be the most ignorant of all beings, since he does not know hatred. To this ignorant and impotent other, which forms the basis for both love and hate, Lacan gives pride of place in his graphs of sexuation as the barred other. Formally speaking, the three passions love, hate, and ignorance, as the three primordial forms of enjoyment, are all stupid. I would argue that stupidity is precisely the blind spot necessary for real intelligence, not because of some mysterious attribute of soul or consciousness, but because of the strictly formal operation of stupidity constitutive of enjoyment. The relationship between intelligence and stupidity is therefore not a simple question of opposites. Stupidity is precisely the part of intelligence that intelligence itself cannot see, 
the place from which the subject of intelligence enjoys itself. While Malibu admirably revises what she perceives as her previous conceptual errors regarding the possibilities of machine intelligence, our conceptions of thinking and its relationship to the brain, she fails to consider the irreducible relationship between intelligence and its constitutive failure, which enters her discourse under the rubric of stupidity. In this sense, it is not the failure to conceive of a community of machines that makes Malibu fall back on the kind of human exceptionalism that she attempted to escape in the first place, but the idea that intelligence can, by means of a careful process of reverse engineering, be eclipsed by its own simulation. This points us not to another poorly disguised argument for human exceptionalism. For example, not all of the subject can be captured by simulation, or there is always a remainder that escapes simulation, but a concern with the failure inherent to intelligence as such, a failure, furthermore, that recuperates the dimension of enjoyment which Malibu omits from her epistemology and which I see as vital to the challenge that Malibu sets us. Malibu's opening gambit is to critique her previously held position on the question of human intelligence in light of new discoveries about the brain and new technologies, which put the unique status of the human brain under erasure. However, her acceptance of the genuinely philosophical problem of the synthetic brain still evades the central problem of subjectivity, which resides in the structure of enjoyment, or in psychoanalytic terms, the sexual non-relation. Malibu begins the conclusion to her investigation into the metamorphoses of intelligence with the following statement. In the end, intelligence is not ours, and it's not theirs either. This resistance to appropriation derives from the ontological paradox that constitutes it. Intelligence has no being and cannot, therefore, belong to anyone. By theirs, she is referring to those who wish to instrumentalize and appropriate the wholesale concept of intelligence in the synthetic recreation and simulation of the human brain, i.e. the neuroscientists of the Blue Brain Project. So Malibu admits intelligence has no being, in a sense an archetypal Lacanian position. Being is lost by virtue of existence. That is to say, as soon as intelligence is reified and instrumentalized, it ceases to be intelligent and becomes stupid. Yet, paradoxically, it is precisely this stupidity which gives rise to the possibility of the conceptualization of intelligence itself. Intelligence is that which is always trying to coincide with itself and fails. The ontological void, constituted by the dialectic, as we shall see, between sex and knowledge. As I will attempt to show towards the final part of this chapter, this third metamorphosis in the concept of intelligence that Malibu refers to then is the position which Lacanian psychoanalytic theory arguably already occupies. Intelligence on this score is, as we shall see, from the outset a paradoxical category at once artificial and stupid. 2.4. Anti-philosophy. Thinking or being. Following Malibu's characterization of the stupidity of ontology, the enjoying blind spot of intelligence, Pasqualini's constitutive failure, the originary trauma of rationality, Bratton's gendered and duplicitous AI, and Parisi's incomputable but real omega number, it seems there is a constellation of crucial psychoanalytic issues emerging. Whilst these thinkers have articulated important and distinct dimensions of the critical treatment of artificial intelligence, they all seem to share a common theme, the unspoken omission of the psychoanalytic subject in philosophical and scientific discourses on AI. Lacan describes this problematic thus. The philosopher is inscribed in the discourse of the master. This doesn't mean that what he says is foolish. It's even more than usable. Nor does it mean, mind you, that he knows what he's saying. The court fool has a role to play, being truth's stand-in. He can play it by speaking like a language, just like the unconscious. That he is himself unconscious is of secondary importance. The important thing is that the role should be played. And then to begin articulating how psychoanalysis, as distinct from philosophy, would approach the question of thinking and knowledge and their relationship to AI, it is necessary to ground the discussion in the logic of the Lacanian subject. This will ultimately lead us to the underlying concept around which this book revolves, 
the sexual non-rapport. Lacan's 1966 paper, Science and Truth, written especially for the Cahier pour l'analyse and delivered at the beginning of Seminar 13, The Object of Psychoanalysis, contains the first textual exposition of Lacan's subject of science, which he equates with the subject of psychoanalysis as that which is represented by a signifier for another signifier. Lacan's overarching aim in the paper is to identify the break in modern science heralded by Newtonian physics that leads to the eventual emergence of the subject of science. This involves delineating the passage that starts from Galileo and Descartes in the 17th century, the century of genius, and culminates in Freud's encounter with the unconscious at the turn of the 20th century. Fundamentally, the subject for Lacan must be rigorously distinguished from the biological individual as from any psychological evolution, subsumable under the subject of understanding. As Ed Pluth points out, at this stage in his teaching, Lacan is trying to work out the status of psychoanalysis as an autonomous discourse, aware of its debt to both structuralism and the natural sciences. He considers the subject to be constituted by a spaltung, or splitting, a gap between the subject of the enunciated content and the subject of enunciation, which is encountered in psychoanalytic practice in the form of the symptom. According to Lacan, psychoanalysis is situated at a specific junction in the history of science, making Freud not an anomaly of the scientific tradition, but a direct product of it. I am saying, contrary to what has been trumped up about a supposed break on Freud's part with the scientism of his time, that it was this very scientism, which one might designate by its allegiance to the ideals of Brute themselves, passed down from Hemholtz to Dubois Raymond's pact to reduce physiology and the mental functions considered to be included therein to the mathematically determined terms of thermodynamics, the latter having attained virtual completion during their lifetimes, that led Freud, as his writings show, to pave the way that shall forever bear his name. That said, the contribution that Freud makes was, in a sense, not to scientific knowledge, but to its absence. Psychoanalysis highlights the persistence in the subject of a relation to a not-knowing. It is also in this essay where Lacan makes reference to Descartes' cogito as the correlate of modern science, a correlation which Descartes himself had misapprehended given his commitment to the belief in a non-deceitful god. The true significance of the Cartesian cogito is not perceived, therefore, until Freud, who realized that the real subject revealed in the cogito is not the ego of the I-think, but the subject of the unconscious who postulates this punctual and vanishing moment of enunciation. Any attempt to incarnate the subject, i.e. in any biologically determined sense, for example, as man, is therefore incompatible with the discoveries of both modern science and psychoanalysis. So fervent is Lacan in his conviction in the futility of pinning down the study of the subject using any of the currently available scientific methods that he makes reference to psychology as the only discipline deserving of that repugnant appellation, science of man, which he points out has found ways to outlive itself by providing services to the technocracy. With reference to to Kengulheim's 1958 essay, What is Psychology? Lacan notes that psychology slides like a toboggan from the pantheon to the prefecture of police. Given the biopolitical ring to Lacan's disdain for psychology with its philosophical pretensions to know something universal about man, only to then march him down to the police station, one can see how the work of science and truth prefigures Lacan's elaboration of the four discourses two years later in Seminar 17. The essay contains Lacan's precursor to the four discourses in his elaboration of the three distinct modes of truth, formal, efficient, and final, which correspond in their structure to science, magic, and religion. These categories of thought, Lacan hints, will in turn find their expression in the differential subjective structures of neurosis, perversion, and psychosis in their respective epistemological drives of Verdrängung, Verlugnung, and Verwirthung. Current thinking on the status of intelligent life in the universe from purportedly scientific mindsets often consists of a baffling mix of magical, religious, and scientific thinking, 
shifting the position of truth as cause within their discourse. Take, for example, Tegmark's reflections on the conscious awakening of the universe. Before the universe awoke, there was no beauty. This makes our cosmic awakening all the more wonderful and worthy of celebrating. It transformed our universe from a mindless zombie with no self-awareness into a living ecosystem, harboring self-reflection, beauty, and hope, and the pursuit of goals, meaning, and purpose. Had our universe never awoken, then, as far as I'm concerned, it would have been completely pointless, merely a gigantic waste of space. Tegmark's quasi-religious sentiments of wonder seem to merge seamlessly with his valoration of the instrumental rationality and genuine surprise at the sheer miraculousness of it all. Magical thinking, Lacan notes, entails a dissimulation of knowledge for the subject of science. This, he says, is one of magic's conditions. It involves the truth as cause in its guise as efficient cause. Religious thought, on the other hand, involves the eschatological operation as truth as final cause in the form of revelation. As for science, Lacan says it does not want to know anything about the truth as cause. A form of foreclosure is thus the way in which science must proceed in order to produce knowledge, what he terms a successful paranoia. In correspondence with Aristotle's four categories of causation, the missing fourth category would then be material causality which subsequently will come to be occupied by the discourse of psychoanalysis in Seminar 17. All four relations to truth will later become formalized in a slightly different configuration as the masters, university, analysts, and hysterics discourse, with science becoming associated with the hysterics discourse as that which ceaselessly produces new knowledge. This formal distinction between truth and knowledge finds its most precise theoretical iteration in the characterization of Lacan's teaching as anti-philosophy, a term which he first used in reference to himself in 1975, in Putetra Vansin, and subsequently mentioned on only two occasions throughout his seminar to refer to his method. The term, however, was not invented by Lacan himself. Despite its origins in religious critiques of rationalism, it is crucial to understand that, for Lacan, anti-philosophy was not a mysticism, nor a religious concern with the ineffable, the human soul, or other such metaphysical concepts. Rather, the point for Lacan was to reassert the primacy of formalization and the structure of the production of knowledge as distinct from philosophical truth. In terms of the psychoanalytic approach to AI, Anti-philosophy offers us an alternative perspective on the stakes of the debate on AI than we have thus far encountered. It is not so much a question of finding new paradigms to think AI, but rather of elucidating exactly how the Lacanian subject is already present in our conception of artificial intelligence and what this means for the relationship between the two. These inherent impossibilities that we have identified reside at the very kernel of both psychoanalysis and AI. Whilst anti-philosophy originated in the 18th century as a reaction to French Enlightenment thought by critics who sought to defend church authority and religious dogma against the rationalist tide that was descending over Europe, for Lacan, as Samo Tomsic notes, the term took on a completely different, not to say opposite, meaning. Anti-philosophy, in this new post-Freudian context, was on the contrary linked by Lacan to the modern scientific revolution and its ramifications for the pre-modern Aristotelian orientation in philosophy and science. For Lacan, the term anti-philosophy was not a mere superficial rejection of philosophy, but rather an interrogation of its formal structure, the discursive position of truth in relation to knowledge. To be precise, it is an interrogation of the imbecilities of philosophy, in Lacan's view, the stupidity of enjoyment. As Tom Sitch notes, anti-philosophy was to form one of the pillars of Lacan's quadrivium in his proposition for the transition of psychoanalytic knowledge, the other three disciplines being linguistics, mathematical logic, and topology. According to Tom Sitch, these other three disciplines are dependent upon Three crucial decentralizations conditioned by scientific modernity, decentralization of language which suspends the organic, pragmatic theory of language, decentralization of knowledge which detached it from the human observer, and finally decentralization of space which progressively gave rise to non-Euclidean geometries and restructured the space of thinking. 
These three domains, Tomsich concludes, linguistics, mathematics, and topology each, could be said to be sciences uniquely concerned with specific dimensions of the Lacanian organon, symbolic, real, and imaginary, respectively. The fourth term in his quadrivium, anti-philosophy, therefore would function as the synthome tying together the Borromean trio as the discipline which resumes the fundamental lesson of psychoanalysis, the decentralization of thinking. Lacan's consistent engagement with the work of important philosophical figures was integral to the different stages of development of his psychoanalytic theory, but it was Lacan's endeavor to mathematize the transmission of psychoanalysis using a plethora of symbols, letters, and algebraic formulas and diagrams, which was a direct attempt to escape the bastardization and misappropriation which befell the Freudian discovery given its deceptive appearance as ordinary language, open to hermeneutic abuse. The mathem, therefore, was in the Greek sense of ta mathematica, that which can be transmitted without loss. One of the key agendas of Lacan's anti-philosophy, according to Adrian Johnston, is to draw attention to the fact that the philosophical and quotidian conception of psychoanalysis as a depth hermeneutics in search of the profound meaning of psychical suffering is a hopelessly wrong-headed misreading of Freud and his place in the history of ideas. As Johnston notes, it is thanks to the scientific rupture signified by the name Galileo that, according to Lacan, the conditions for Freud's discovery became possible in the first place. Superficial rebuttals of the claim to call Lacan an anti-philosopher then often rely on an objection that what Lacan meant by philosophy was either a proxy for university discourse, as he elaborated in his four discourses in Seminar 17, or that, on the other hand, the philosophy he had in mind was that of the deluso guattarian kind, which was ostensibly mounting his anti-Oedipal attack on psychoanalysis in the post-68 revolutionary era. These strands of straw man argumentation, however, do not get to the crux of what is really at stake in Lacan's significance in relation to the discipline of philosophy. Alain Badou, who devoted an entire seminar series to Lacan's anti-philosophical endeavors, designates him anti-philosopher exemplar, along with figures such as Gorgias, Pascal, Rousseau, Kierkegaard, Nietzsche, and Wittgenstein before him. For Badou, modern philosophy is only possible after first traversing Lacan. Indeed, he places Lacan as third in a succession of such pivotal figures in the history of philosophy as Plato and Kant. According to Matthew Sharp's reading, Lacan's claim to be an anti-philosopher in his later teachings has a number of related origins. Firstly, the concern with philosophy as a historical cultural practice of extracting knowledge. This Lacan derives from the influence of Alexandre Kojive and his reading of Hegel's master-slave dialectic. On this account, the master was never the man of knowledge, but rather the warrior prepared to fight to the death in the struggle for recognition. The master converts the slave's practical knowledge, or techne, his lived savoir-faire, into theoretical knowledge, episteme. Sharp points us here to the primal scene of this paradigm of philosophy, which Lacan locates in Seminar 17 as Plato's Mino, in which the slave boy is made to recall mathematical knowledge that he didn't know he had through Socrates' questioning. Refer to the Mino, where it is a question of the square root of two, and it's incommensurable. There's someone who says, Hey look, get the slave to come over. That little fellow, can't you see he knows? For Lacan, it is this transubstantiation of knowledge from technical know-how, the slave's drawings in the sand, into theoretical episteme, i.e. Euclidean geometry, that constitutes pre-modern philosophy. Philosophy, in its historical function, is this extraction, I would almost say this betrayal of the slave's knowledge in order to obtain its transmutation into the master's knowledge. Whilst this characterization of philosophy as the master's discourse is susceptible to the critique that it homogenizes the whole of philosophy into one type of thinking or one disciplinary form, Lacan will later shift his anti-philosophical critique to a slightly different target. In Seminar 20, Sharp shows how Lacan mounts his critique again, this time for the types of metaphysical claims philosophers per se are prone to making. Again, Lacan reaches back into the history of philosophy, this time to the pre-Socratics. First of all, it can be said that we have changed the thinking subject considerably. 
since the I am thinking that presupposes itself grounds existence, we have had to take a step, that of the unconscious. The subject is not the one who thinks. The subject is precisely the one we encourage, not to say it all, as we tell him in order to charm him. One cannot say it all, but rather utter stupidities. That is the key. Here, Lacan is referring to what he sees as the fundamental presupposition of pre-modern philosophy, deriving from Parmenides of Elia's poem, specifically this passage. For without the being in relation to which it is uttered, you cannot find thinking. For there neither is nor shall be anything outside of being, since fate, Moira, bound it to be whole and immovable. For that reason... All these will be mere names which mortals have laid down, convinced that they were true, coming to be as well as passing away, being as well as non-being, and also change of place and change of shining color. In response to this, Lacan notes that it is precisely because he was a poet that Parmenides says what he has to say to us in the least stupid of manners. Otherwise, the idea that being is and non-being is not I do not know what that means to you, but personally I find that stupid. The elision of thinking and being, Lacan takes as paradigmatic of the whole of Western philosophy right up through Hegel's The Real is the Rational. According to Lacan, it is an error to assume that all that can be thought necessarily can also be, or that the world is a mirror of the subject who thinks it. As Sharp points out, this imaginary gestalt of the oneness of being and thinking Lacan ascribes to some fundamental pre-modern axioms that derive from the Aristotelian notion of the spherical nature of the universe. He sees the decisive break with the advent of modern science, taking his cue, however, not from the Copernican revolution that displaces the Earth from the center of the universe, but rather from the Keplerian discovery of the elliptical orbit of stars. Displacing all the celestial bodies instead to one side of the bipolar ellipsis, the other point always being in empty space. Ultimately, Lacan sees the beginning of the subject of modern science as Descartes' cogito. Lacan regards the Cartesian cogito not as hypostatized being that thinks, but a punctual evanescent moment. This performative character of the cogito guarantees only that there is thinking, not that there is a thing that thinks, as he remarks in Science and Truth which is why it is worth restating that in the test of writing, I am thinking, therefore I am, with quotes around the second clause, it is legible that thought only ground being by nodding itself in speech, where every operation goes right to the essence of language. In Seminar 11, Lacan gives his account of the cogito as a forced choice between cogito and sum. Here, Lacan makes the distinction between thinking and being. One must choose between the two, if one chooses thinking, one must give up being and vice versa. Lacan's point in this forced choice is that soon doesn't follow once one has made the first step. Thought depends on the signifier, which turns the subject into the empty point of enunciation, instead of founding his or her being. In the place of the supposed certainty of the subject's being, there is just a void. As Delar explains, it is not the same subject that thinks and that is. The one that is is not the one that thinks. Even more, the one that is, is ultimately not a subject at all. Lacan's point, simply put, is that being and thinking are different concepts. Returning to our earlier philosophical approaches to artificial intelligence, their concerns with failure, dupery, incomputability, and stupidity, we may recognize a certain impossibility emerging. This impossibility arises by virtue of what Lacan would call the split or barred subject. It is precisely the split between being and thinking that radically changes the way we may conceptualize AI as a thinking thing. This split between being and thinking at the heart of Lacan's theory of the subject casts a light on philosophical conceptualizations of AI as a discrete form of intelligence in contradistinction to so-called real intelligence. The subject of knowledge is already one riven between the truth of the enunciation and the enjoyment produced discursively. Lacan's main contention against philosophy, then, was its aim to sense, which, for him, was what differed about the truth of psychoanalysis, since the unconscious is the fact that being, by speaking, enjoys. Perhaps AI is best conceived not as a thing which thinks, but a thing which is thought, nor, as Lacan puts it, 
The problem with the kind of science I qualify as traditional, because it comes to us from Aristotle's thought, is that it implies that what is thought of is in the image of thought, in other words, that being thinks. The human subject is spoken by language. It is because of this enjoyment that the truth of psychoanalysis, as he articulates in Le Tudy, is an absence, a lack of sense. The absence is the whole in symbolization that is otherwise referred to as the non-existent sexual relation. The Lacanian sexual non-relation is ultimately located within the dimension of language as the organ of castration and thus the creation of jouissance. The philosophical question of truth is thereby supplanted by the anti-philosophical, psychoanalytic question of enjoyment. This means that metaphysical knowledge becomes sexual knowledge. It is the question of enjoyment in lieu of sense that is the pursuit of the psychoanalysis as opposed to the philosophy of artificial intelligence. In the following chapter, I will examine the object of this enjoyment.